Welcome to Drive Live. My name is Dion Knowles. I'm from Tech Equipment, and today I'm joined by Kirsten Penton with Roland the dog. Hello, Kirsten. Hi. I'm Kirsten. This is uh, Roland. Kirsten is a manufacturing engineer, and we're going to be talking about all of Kirsten's different roles. You started out, I believe, uh, in doing a HND. Yeah. In was it manufacturing, computer-aided manufacturing engineering? Yeah. So <clears throat> it started um, when I was a kid at school. I just thought I was going to be a maths teacher. I was oh, very that. shy, very quiet, but it was something I understood. Um, so I went to sixth form and I wanted to do maths, physics and art. And they told me I wouldn't go to university with art. It wasn't academic enough. So I did biology, which I love. Um, but my physics teacher, he said to me, I think you'd make a good engineer because you're very creative. I can see the creative flair that you have. And I said, girls don't do engineering. That's not not what we do so he went out of his way to send me on a course women into engineering at Manchester University and it was a, a day of what is civil engineering and what is aerospace engineering mechanical oh, right fantastic and it was it just I mean, there was a room full of women um from all different backgrounds and so I decided that's what I wanted to do however I did really bad in my A-levels and I didn't get the qualifications to go straight on a degree. Right, okay. So I did something called a two plus two. Yeah. Which is two years HND and then you join the second year of your degree. And you know what? I'm so grateful that that was what happened. The computer-aided manufacturing engineering, you learn how to weld how oh. you use CNC programming, you were very hands-on on all right. of the manufacturing processes. Because then when I went on to the degree, it was very theoretical. So it was so useful to have done the hands-on before you do the theory. It makes me more relatable now in work because I can talk about manufacturing processes you know first hand so yeah so so that's it took me a little bit longer to get my degree but I got a two one uh first person in the family to to get a degree so my mum was very proud but then I couldn't get a job which uh which was a shame and what was you know is that because there were a shortage of jobs at the time because you were a woman at the time, doing the degree, right. all, all women into engineering, oh, they all, everyone wants a woman engineer. No, they don't. No, they don't. So this is 25 years ago. Right. And I couldn't get a job. One, I had no experience. Yeah. And two, I look like this. So I literally had to just start at the bottom and work very very hard to prove myself um i worked so it started off it was selling a car uh, no uh, building cable trains was was the was the um the factory um and i would do sales and put demo kits together for the sales teams and invoicing and speaking to the suppliers so again another great foundation respectful of what other people do in the industry um and then I just had to keep hopping a bit up and a bit up. Kirsten you know I don't want to dwell too much on the women in engineering because that doesn't define you you're an amazing engineer that's what defines you your perseverance um but how do you think your experience when you started out compares to what it was like what it's like today when you see other women going starting out a career in engineering and do you think there's still some of those barriers there that uh, I would say there aren't hardly any barriers there I mean people you know there's always perhaps personality class whether you're male or female 
there were different generations of people in every uh, manufacturing site. You know, you've got the old traditional people who come for apprenticeship and, you know, skilled. Um, and then you've got the more modern people. But I would say still very little women into engineering, very few. I think on our site, we have about 600 people and maybe two. Right. Okay. Female engineers, it's it's still quite rare, mm. but definitely treated more equally now. Then you went to work for Autolive, and this is when yeah. you were working on the design of airbags, is that right? This was amazing. So I got taken on as a junior manufacturing engineer. So I was there, I got the title, junior manufacturing engineer. I worked with the most amazing people. My manager was female. Uh, she was wonderful and a great team. So that was down in Congleton. That's so not that was horrible. <laughs> um, as a manufacturing engineer, which was um, understanding how to make an airbag in the most lean way. From there, it developed into um, designing the machinery to help to make that put him down. To make the airbags and they gave me side impact airbag new completely new audi renault peugeot kirsten you will liaise with the r d department and then you will design the machinery and the processes and all the work instructions to make this and it was a fantastic job however um, you didn't get paid very much and you worked incredibly long hours. But they knew it was a good experience. You know, it was a great job to have. And what I found was um, having to work with the guys on the shop floor because they were having to use the machine. So very much about the ergonomics and the usability. And then I was learning all schematics and how machines work, which was really interesting. But the, the, the key part of this was working with R&D. What a different world they live in. So um, I hope I'm not exaggerating here, but my memory is here's an airbag that's been qualified by the R&D department. You now take that to full production. We'll need a thousand a week. And here was these two bits of fabric held together with staples, print stick, blue tack okay go and make that productionized so they had qualified the design you know they're very very clever people but never thought about how are we actually going to make this yeah everything was hand sewn handmade and to go into a full production line with it was so disjointed Kurt, of course, we learnt a lot. So then I asked to transition. I asked to be the manufacturing engineer, but working in R&D. They would, you know, we, we would be now in the same building, in the same room, and they'd be walking around with all these like bits of paper and bits of fabric. But then we, we, we were talking about, Kirsten, I, 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 I need to sew this together, but I need to have an event open to put the explosion, you know, explosive mechanism in. How do you think we could do that from a production point of view? So it was fantastic all of a sudden we were starting to understand each other and from that we learned how to go from concept to production really quickly. Fantastic, what's an, what's an advocate for a career in engineering? <laughs> I know if you ever do, I'm, I'm sure I you know you're part of STEM groups and I've done a few things where I've gone into schools and the first thing kids ask you is, well, what do you get paid? And do you get, you know, if you go on business trips, do you get everything paid for? Um, that, you know, that's always one of the first things that they consider. Perhaps that's not the really serious students. Uh, the serious students want to ask about the details. No, but, but on a serious note, engineering is a very well-paid job. Mm. I started off very low paid. I appreciate that now. I had to work very hard to move up the ladder. I appreciate everything I have now. Uh, but it was when I got to Marconi that I, that I got the step change in the salary. Yeah. Um, and they, they really did look after me. So I had several years there, very happy. 
um, developing the processes in my little building 44. <clears throat> and then they got taken over. There were, there were some very bad decisions made with stocks and shares by the Marconi management and Marconi was no more. Mm. So it got taken over by a company called Jabel, mm -hmm. an American company. And this um, big stereotypical guy came over what was his name now? Phil. And people were very resistant for change. And this was the first time really I'd seen the difficulty of change management. Right. People didn't want to change. They were one big happy family. Everything mm. was fine. Leave us alone. And then this big American guy <clears throat> coming over saying, hey, guys, come on, come on, you know. Um, and yeah, it, it, that was a difficult time. It is, I mean, it is so challenging when you've got two organisations merging together, particularly if you've got a small organisation that's like very much of a tight knit family culture and then they're coming into a bigger organisation. And while ever the bigger organisation wants a vision of respecting those values of the small organisation, they still have to meet in the middle, they still have to become yeah. one. And that is for some such massive boundary to overcome and just takes so many years and I think that's often underestimated that culture that period of culture change that's it that was my first exposure to the difficulty in in people change management um <clears throat> people became rebellious um negative and really they their jobs had been saved mm -hmm. Um, and Phil was great and he had a battle on his hands but I loved his resilience he would say we're going camping next weekend I would say I can't go camping <laughs> he's like why I'm like I'm going back to Blackpool um, to see my mum for a few days and my sisters and my brother so I can't go camping he went just come back a day early and we'll meet you at the train station. I was like, I haven't got a, I haven't got a tent. I'll get you one. There was no excuse. And this guy would make us do these activities and it was almost forcing us to rebuild all our bonds. Did um, it work? Pardon? Did it work? Was Absolutely. It... He would make us go out quite often on a pub crawl together with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, we pay for it, but it, he was determined to break down the barriers of us, us and them. Yeah. And it worked. However, the company had lost too much money. Right. So Marconi was a huge site on Edge Lane and to close that down was horrific for everybody. Mm. But the the mother company was in Coventry right. and so I was asked would you take these robots down to Coventry and set them up <clears throat> and take about three months you staying there living in a hotel mm. um, and I was like oh, I don't know whether I could live away from home for that long I was like okay let's be brave again say yes oh, I had a brilliant time oh it was so great there was a team of like a dozen of us that went down we just lived the ball we worked hard we played hard but unfortunately it was too late for Coventry so on my last day Phil came to me and said we're going to have to move it to Hungary and I went I don't think I can and he said, it'll be about five months. Will you go? I need you to go. You're the only one who understands these robots. Uh, I said, who else is going? He says, nobody. And you can't tell anybody. Yeah, so I, I spoke to my family. And again, I didn't want to. But then there was something niggling me saying, if you don't do this, you'll regret it. Mm. So I went out one Easter and uh, not Easter October 
<clears throat> for Halloween to meet the guy. So uh, it was a Scottish manager who had gone from our Scottish site. The site is at a place called Tisa Valosh. It was two and a half hours drive out of Budapest. And you were going down the motorway and then it just turned to a dirt track. And then you went for about another hour and you ended up at this little tiny village that looked like it had been built in the 1960s. Beautiful factory in the middle of it with marble floors. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful, but it was so cold. I went there, it was um, Halloween. I got invited to the manager's house for a Halloween party, very welcoming. So I stayed eight months. I absolutely loved the opportunity to work with a different culture set of people. I represented this part of my career as a Trabant car because yes. that's mainly what they drove. Yes, yeah. Um, very simple, humble lifestyle. And well, then, for Amelia, who's we've got Amelia Lowry who's on, uh, who's watching, and she says, uh, I think she's ha she's had to really struggle as a start out. Yeah. Um, she was told she only got the job because she was a girl because they needed to sort out the diversity yeah and now she's worked for a year and proven herself um and kind of working on a part-time on a on a final year degree but i think that's kind of heartening what your experience because you said yeah it's really hard to go in there to start with but it's actually through perseverance and people looking beyond the agenda uh, and they've been able to give you the, all these amazing opportunities and recognize yeah. your talent and you've just got to be brave and say do you know what i'll give it a go and it's about your energy your enthusiasm your ability to communicate with all different levels yeah. i would say is key yeah um you know I, at the beginning of my career i was knocked back a lot yeah failed my a levels had to do a hnd couldn't get a job but do you know it's given me the confidence now to to be a better person because I've, I've almost worked from the bottom up you know whenever I start a job I always ask to learn the job that the operators do first if you don't get buy-in from the people who are going to not work for you but take on your processes if you don't get them involved then it's not sustainable if you're going to go into engineering i recommend that you do look into oh sorry the dog. <laughs> hey, um creative problem solving methods and also um i would say lean six sigma changed my life right um i run my whole life now as a demaic project my children don't know it <laughs> but, you know the way we talk about issues mm -hmm. the way the house gets tidied the way things are organized uh, everything is is lean six sigma um and i think find a job that you love find something that you're interested in uh, makes a big difference fantastic so i think the big message is find a job you love find listen job you to love. people be humble be yeah. open-minded yeah be creative in your problem solving. Absolutely. And, and, you know, from your perspective, you've got to say, you've got to be perseverance and take risks. That's what you've shown is you've had some amazing managers, but you've also come up against a lot of traditionalists along your way. You've had to battle um, to get where you are. Well done. What an amazing story, Kirsten. It's been such a wonderful pleasure to talk to you today.